many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or, if we say that God always existed, why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here? These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. Who knows for certain? Who shall here declare it? Whence was it born? Whence came creation? The gods are later than this world's formation. Who then can know the origins of the world? None knows whence creation arose, or whether he has or has not made it, he who surveys it from the lofty skies. Only he knows, or perhaps he knows not. These words are 3,500 years old. They're taken from the Rig Veda, a collection of early Sanskrit hymns. The most sophisticated ancient cosmological ideas came from Asia and particularly from India. Here, there's a tradition of skeptical questioning and unselfconscious humility before the great cosmic mysteries. Amidst the routine of daily life, in, say, the harvesting and winnowing of grain, people all over the world have wondered, where did the universe come from? Asking this question is a hallmark of our species. There's a natural tendency to understand the origin of the cosmos in familiar biological terms, the mating of cosmic deities or the hatching of a cosmic egg, or maybe the intonation of some magic phrase. The Big Bang is our modern scientific creation myth. It comes from the same human need to solve the cosmological riddle. Most cultures imagine the world to be only a few hundred human generations old. Hardly anyone guessed that the cosmos might be far older, but the ancient Hindus did. They, like every other society, noted and calibrated the cycles in nature. The rising and setting of the sun and stars, the phases of the moon, the passing of the seasons. All over South India, an age-old ceremony takes place every January, a rejoicing in the generosity of nature in the annual harvesting of the crops. Every January, nature provides the rice to celebrate Pangal. Even the draft animals are given the day off and garlanded with flowers. Colorful designs are painted on the ground to attract harmony and good fortune for the coming year. Pangal, a simple porridge, a mixture of rice and sweet milk, 
symbolizes the harvest, the return of the seasons. However, this is not merely a harvest festival. It has ties to an elegant and much deeper cosmological tradition. The Pungal Festival is the rejoicing in the fact that there are cycles in nature. But how could such cycles come about unless the gods will them? And if there are cycles in the years of humans, might there not be cycles in the eons of the gods? The Hindu religion is the only one of the world's great faiths dedicated to the idea that the cosmos itself undergoes an immense, indeed an infinite, number of deaths and rebirths. It is the only religion in which the timescales correspond, no doubt by accident, to those of modern scientific cosmology. Its cycles run from our ordinary day and night to a day and night of Brahma, 8.64 billion years long, longer than the age of the Earth or the Sun, and about half the time since the Big Bang. And there are much longer time scales still. There is the deep and appealing notion that the universe is but the dream of the god who, after a hundred Brahma years, dissolves himself into a dreamless sleep and the universe dissolves with him until, after another Brahma century, he stirs, recomposes himself and begins again to dream the great cosmic lotus dream. Meanwhile, elsewhere, there are an infinite number of other universes, each with its own god, dreaming the cosmic dream. These great ideas are tempered by another, perhaps still greater. It is said that men may not be the dreams of the gods, but rather that the gods are the dreams of men. In India, there are many gods, and each god has many manifestations. These Chola bronzes cast in the 11th century include several different incarnations of the god Shiva, seen here at his wedding. The most elegant and sublime of these bronzes is a representation of the creation of the universe at the beginning of each cosmic cycle, a motif known as the cosmic dance of Shiva. The god has four hands. In the upper right hand is a drum whose sound is the sound of creation. In the upper left hand is a tongue of flame, a reminder that the universe, now newly created, will, billions of years from now, be utterly destroyed. Creation, destruction. profound and lovely ideas are central to ancient Hindu beliefs as exemplified in this Chola temple at Daras Suram. They are a kind of premonition of modern astronomical ideas. 
Without doubt, the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang. But it is by no means clear that it will continue to expand forever. If there is less than a certain amount of matter in the universe, then the mutual gravitation of the receding galaxies will be insufficient to stop the expansion, and the universe will run away forever. But if there is more matter than we can see, hidden away in black holes, say, or in hot but invisible gas between the galaxies, then the universe holds together and partakes of a very Indian succession of cycles, expansion followed by contraction, cosmos upon cosmos, universes without end. If we live in such an oscillating universe, then the Big Bang is not the creation of the cosmos, but merely the end of the previous cycle, the destruction of the last incarnation of the cosmos. Neither of these modern cosmologies may be altogether to our liking. In one cosmology, the universe is created somehow from nothing 15 to 20 billion years ago and expands forever. The galaxies mutually receding until the last one disappears over our cosmic horizon. Then the galactic astronomers are out of business. The stars cool and die. Matter itself decays. And the universe becomes a thin, cold haze of elementary particles. In the other, the oscillating universe, the cosmos has no beginning and no end. And we are in the midst of an infinite cycle of cosmic deaths and rebirths, with no information trickling through the cusps of the oscillation. Nothing of the galaxies, stars, planets, life forms, civilizations evolved in the previous incarnation of the universe trickles through the cusp, flitters past the Big Bang to be known in our universe. The death of the universe in either cosmology may seem a little depressing, but we may take some solace in the time scales involved. These events will take tens of billions of years or more. Human beings or our descendants, whoever they might be, can do a great deal of good in tens of billions of years before the cosmos dies. If the universe truly oscillates, if the modern scientific version of the old Hindu cosmology is valid, then still stranger questions arise. Some scientists think that when redshift is followed by blue shift, causality will be inverted and effects will precede causes. First, the ripples spread out from a point on the water's surface. Then I throw the stone into the pond. Some scientists wonder, in an oscillating universe, about what happens at the cusps, at the transition from contraction to expansion. Some think that the laws of nature are then randomly reshuffled, that the kinds of physics and chemistry we have in this universe represent only one of an infinite range of possible natural laws. It is easy to see that only a very restricted range of laws of nature are consistent with galaxies and stars, planets, life, and intelligence. If the laws of nature are randomly reshuffled at the cusps, then it is only the most extraordinary coincidence that the cosmic slot machine has this time come up with a universe consistent with us. Do we live in a universe which expands forever or in one where there is a nested set of infinite cycles? There's a way to find out the answer to that question, not by mysticism, but through science, by making an accurate census of the total amount of matter in the universe, or 
by seeing to the very edge of the cosmos.